Can I get a quick raise of hands for anybody who's ever had a skin check? Good, yeah, me too. You know, you're sitting there in that doctor's office, you got that paper thin gown on, it's open in the back, isn't it? You get that breeze. <laughs> I did too. You sit there on that bench, bed thing on that paper that crinkles when you sit on it, and the doctor's looking at you with that magnifying glass, and he's looking at every single mole, every single red spot, and he doesn't miss anywhere. The problem is, sometimes, there's that awkward pause, and the doctor's looking at that, and he says, how long has this been here? And you think, I didn't even know anything was back there. Does it look all right? <laughs> I say, well, you know, I think we better take this out, just to be sure. They're gonna take it out. Now you wait, right? You wait, and then they come back with that tray, and what's on the tray? The long needle and syringe, the scalpel, the specimen jar. And don't you wish that instead of that, it was something like this, sitting there. And they pick it up and they tell you, all we need to do is take a little skin sample with a click. And we can get all the information we need to tell you what's going on back there. Well, you can't have that, at least not yet. You see, I think that there is a lot of information in the skin, even a little tiny piece of skin. Your entire genome is in there. You know, you can tell whether that's a cancer or not. You have a baby, you can tell whether that rash is from an inflammatory disease, an infectious disease, or whether it's caused by the cat. You can, you can tell whether the anti-wrinkle cream that you paid way too much for is actually ironing out those wrinkles overnight. You can do a lot with a tiny piece of skin, but how do you get it? Well, ever since I was little, I was fascinated with tiny things. And as I grew technology, my mother is a medical oncologist. My father is a computer programmer, hardware, software interfaces. And I wound up somewhere halfway in between. I don't think that was on accident. I think as we, as we think about medicine and we think about how we take care of ourselves and our kids, something that we can do at home with a microneedle, like diabetics do every day. They take samples, they monitor glucose every day. We can do things like that too and do a lot more with it. I think that's very powerful. And that's why I do the research that I do. I did a PhD at the University of Texas under a mentor named Jim Leary. During the day, I worked on delivering uh, genes to white blood cells to help astronauts cope with the ionizing radiation that they would get when they went to Mars and make sure that they could make it back. At night, we worked on some of the most sophisticated cell sorting uh, technology that there was. We're sorting a million cells a second to pluck out that one cell that we wanted. When I moved to, uh, to Baltimore, Maryland to do my postdoc with uh, Jerry Luddy, we were delivering nanoparticles to the eyes of diabetic animals to stop diabetic retinopathy, to stop diabetic uh, blindness. And we're also looking into the mechanisms that cause uh, blindness in infants that are born prematurely and exposed to too much oxygen. And it was at that point that I had an epiphany. It wasn't a very positive epiphany. I realized that even though I was having fun and I was working very hard on this next generation technology, it really was next generation or the next generation or not at all. It was so far away from the clinic that I wouldn't be able to see anybody use it in my lifetime or my kid's lifetime. And I thought to myself, how can, I, how can I do better? How can I get closer to something that might actually be used by us, by my kids, my kids' kids? And I found a job of all places in Brisbane, Australia. And the job description was a, a position looking for someone to help shrink that long needle that they used to vaccinate kids into a tiny patch with little tiny needles that you couldn't even see, that you couldn't even feel so that you could vaccinate the baby and they would stay asleep. And to me, that was powerful. And I thought that maybe that could be something that could be used in my lifetime, my kid's lifetime. And so I took the job, moved to Australia, and I was surrounded by an incredible group of scientists. We patented some of the work that we did and it was, uh, it was rolled out into a, a startup company that got $40 million. But you know what? 
I left just before that happened. <laughs> so I missed out on that. But you know what I didn't miss out on was a validation in my belief that taking and compressing that medicine is something that is minimally invasive, was powerful. People wanted it. And, you know, these things are coming. So I left and I started my own uh, research group. And in 2013, I was working in the Dermatology Research uh, Center, and I was working with the head of dermatology, Professor Peter So he's an incredible dermatologist, phenomenal dermatopathologist, and a bit of a visionary, too. One night he asked me, he said, Tarl, and he's an Austrian fellow, he had a thick German accent, and I'm not going to do the accent. <laughs> but he said, Tarl, can you make me a nanobiopsy? And I thought to myself, there's no way I can make this. So I said, well, I can make a microbiopsy, which is a bit larger, take a little chunk of skin out. And then there was a spark of an idea, not just in my mind, but in his mind, and all the other people that we talked to about this idea, that a small biopsy device could do some very special things in the world, could change the world. So I went back to the lab. My PhD student, Lynn Lee, and my uh, engineer, Alex Ansaldo, and I, we made a microbiopsy. And you know what? It worked the first time. <laughs> Nothing works the first time. We were very lucky. We continue to be lucky. People from all over the world saw our publications. They emailed us. They called us. They wrote us they want the device. To, uh, today, we've made over 10,000 of these, and we've shipped them all around the world. My postdoc, uh, Nico Yamada, has been managing a lot of these clinical trials and a lot of these projects for us these days. I'm now a professor at the uh, Future Industries Institute at the University of South Australia. And she gets emails uh, day and night, and we're working with groups around the world. And I wanted to show you uh, this picture. This is from uh, Alan Warburg's group. He's uh, a professor in Israel, and he is doing a study in Africa and Ghana and Ethiopia. And these are some of the participants in that study, getting microbiopsies uh, for a skin parasite. And uh, he enrolled somewhere over, I, I forget, 160, 200 volunteers in this study. It was a, quite a big study. And if the microbiopsy can work there, it can work anywhere. And so, you know, as, as time goes along, thank you, as time goes along, uh, Miko said a couple of months ago, actually, she said, I got, a, I got an email from Germany, from Munich. They're doing a study with uh, 400 infants from birth until a few years of age, looking at uh, inflammatory lesions. You can kind of see in the red there and taking microbiopsies from them. She had just shipped out about three or 400 of the devices. And you know what? They tried them. Babies didn't wake up. To me, that's powerful. <laughs> but you know what? There's a problem. In order to make it a reality, as something that's normal, something that you and I can use in our daily lives, we need more. You know, there are healthcare providers, doctors, pathology service providers. They have to change their business models, their workflows. We have to change how we think about medicine and how we take care of ourselves and our kids. So it's difficult. But here's how you can help. The next time you're in that doctor's office and you're wearing that drafty gown, and they're going to take it out, stop, stop them for just a moment and ask your doctor. And I'll give you the, the, the key words here, the buzzwords. Is there anything minimally invasive that you can use to get the same answer? Are there any imaging techniques that you can use to figure out what's going on there? And if you ask them that, that's pretty powerful because they may not know and they may have to ask someone else. And you've educated your doctor which is pretty special. And I think if enough of us do that, the world will change, and we can start living a reality where we don't wait to make an appointment to go see the doctor. We don't wait to get our test result back. We don't have unnecessary scars. And instead, we have early diagnosis. We have better quality of life. And you know what? The power is in our hands.